Hi guys. I uh, I just wanted to talk about endometriosis today. Uh, I've been speaking to a lot of different people lately and for some reason there seems to always be trends with the types of people that I talk to and recently there's been a lot of conversations around endometriosis whether I'm speaking to people that are dealing with endometriosis and are and curious about working with me and, and what I do um, or just in normal conversations. So near that New Year's Day, I was in a normal conversation with a normal conversation, a conversation with uh, someone that I had just met and talking about what I do actually. And I just happened to mention um, I work with women, a lot of women, not all women, but uh, men too, but women who ha often have a lot of hormonal issues and uh, we store a lot of emotions in our pelvic floor and our pelvic region and, you know, if uh, a lot of women have issues like endometriosis or uterine fibroids or um, PCOS or um, heavy sit periods and uh, period issues and PMS symptoms and a lot of that's all in this pelvic region. So, and she just happened to say, oh yeah, well, I actually have endometriosis. I didn't know that. I was just sharing what I wanted to share. So uh, what I thought I'd do today is go over endometriosis and sort of talk about the condition and the things that your doctor isn't going to tell you, particularly if you go to see a surgeon. And a lot of the time I speak to people and they're about to have surgery or they've been told they need to have surgery at some point and they've had conversations with their, their doctor and then they've, they've gone um, gone down the special route and said, okay, you're probably going to have to have surgery at some point. Now, it doesn't mean that surgery is not essential because often when endometriosis is so far gone or at a certain point where it is really impacting the quality of your life, it is necessary. However, what I've noticed is a lot of people have this um, idea that once the surgery is done, it will be gone. And the reality is that the reoccurrence of endometriosis, like the stats, is about 40 to 50 percent will, will reoccur after about two years. And so that's pretty high. Um, and I actually just say it's probably more than that if you looked at the stats further on. So, and then there's got to be further surgery. So First of all, first thing, what is endometriosis? Because you may know it or you've been told you have it or you know someone have it, but you might not totally understand it. Um, but endometriosis basically in really simple terms is the um, tissue that's inside the uterus is growing outside the uterus. And uh, it can cause pain and other problems um, and cause issues with reproduction. And so it can be in the, it's basically in the wrong spot that, that, um, that tissue is growing in the wrong spot. It shouldn't be there. And it can be um, in the uterus, but also in the pelvis. So it can surround the bladder. It can cause problems with urination. It can be in um, other parts of like in the hips, like uh, in the, around the joints. It can, can be around the bowel. It can cause digestion issues. This depends on the severity of it and also will cause issues with uh, when we get our period and pain is the biggest symptom. And so about one in 10 women uh, are affected by this. And there's a lot of also, I don't know the stat off the top of my head, but about women that are actually undiagnosed with, um, with endometriosis. So they might have a lot of painful periods, but they've actually not gone down the route of actually getting it investigated. And so pain is usually the biggest issue, but it's during their cycle when they get their period or also during ur urination. Um, it can be other symptoms like headaches and um, more severity of PMS symptoms. And really we've got to have the conversation around, okay, where is it coming from and what, what, what's causing it, what's driving it? And this is the conversation that doesn't really happen with the doctors, because their job is ultimately, they've only got a few tools in their tool belt, and this is no disrespect to that um, that uh, allopathic model in terms of what people do, because their intentions are good. 
but it's not looking at the underlying drivers and how did we get here in the first place? And often also the solutions that are provided if they're non-surgical are not also addressing the root causes, which is usually like go on the pill or we'll give you the marina, which um, you know, can help, but it helps because there's a hormonal imbalance and there's all these other problems going on and it will, it will sort of um, dampen it, but it still doesn't remove it because if you stop going on the, if you remove the medication, stop taking the medication, you eventually it comes back and you still got the same problem. Um, so there's a couple of root causes. Now, when we want to look at the root causes, we're going to go what's happening in the physical realm, physical and biochemical, and what's also happening in the emotional aspect because they're two very they're very interconnected and the way that I work is looking at someone and holistically that perspective of when someone's got any an issue going on what's driving it and where's it coming from and what are the real root causes of it so starting with the the biochemistry aspect and how that's manifesting as the physical is inflammation is always the real real big driver with endometriosis, there is a huge, huge amount of um, inflammation. Now, with any type of period, PMS, heavy period cycle issue, whenever there is an issue, there is inflammation. Now, think of ISIS um, and the word itis means inflammation. So there's a lot of conditions that we have that will indicate tell us there's inflammation. But with endometriosis, um, there is also inflammation as the driver, but it's not the it's not inflammation of it's it's the, the the definition of it is different, but there's still that inflammation underneath. And so when we're talking about hormonal imbalance, uh, what is it that what does that mean? And so there's a couple of aspects to here to this. First one is estrogen dominance, and estrogen dominance is because estrogen is the primary hormone involved in the development and progression of endometriosis and too much estrogen, and it promotes the growth of the endometrial tissue outside the uterus, right? So this is one of the big drivers, but it's not the only one, but it's one of the big ones. And it basically means that there, there's too much estrogen in the body, but it might not be the estrogen that we're making. It can also come from... It's, a lot of it is, is uh, from a thing called xenoestrogen and their environmental toxins that we're exposed to that actually mimic estrogen and then our body will act a certain way. So this comes from plastics, phthalates, BPA, all the chemicals in our environment, in our makeup, in our skincare, on our food, pesticides, alcohol. Um, you know, so there's a lot of aspects to our lifestyle that actually can impact that, right? The other, the other part of this is also, uh, and I'll talk about this in a minute, is the gut, but it's not necessarily meaning that you're having, making too much estrogen when you might not be clearing it. And this is where our detoxification pathways must be very well working, including our bowel movements and our gut for us to clear this. So estrogen dominance is part of that. Now, the other side to the point of that is also low progesterone. And so progesterone is the balance that will naturally help balance our estrogen. And if we don't make enough progesterone, which a lot of women are actually low in, they're not making adequate levels of progesterone. Progesterone is anti-inflammatory. It can often counterbalance the symptoms of um, endometriosis, but for even period pain. And if there's any type of PMS type symptom as well, like even if you don't have endometriosis, my, the, my first port of call is what's happening with progesterone. Is what, how high is progesterone? Is it at adequate level? Um, the other hormone or the group of hormones that can be um, a problem or out of balance is that the androgen hormones, which is the group of male hormones that we make. And sometimes these can also be high in endometriosis. And they can also cause growth of the tissue and lead to painful symptoms. And we've got to also then go, why is their estrogen in balance? Why is there high estrogen? Is there high um, low progesterone? Is there high androgen? And why? And what are the things that drive that estrogen and androgen particularly to be out of balance? And so um, this is a big 
part of it and this is what you've got to understand. And so then when we go to the what, like why is this happening, we've got to look at the gut because the gut is um, a big part of our detoxification process. It's also where most of our immune system um, resides. And so when we think about inflammation, that is our immune system. It's an inflammatory response. Most of this, a lot of this comes from the gut and what's happening in the gut. Um, digestive issues and endometriosis go very hand in hand. A lot of women that have endometriosis will ha also have um, bowel issues because sometimes there can be lesions in the bowel, things like this that can impact it. But it's also going back to the gut. There's inflammation happening in the gut. And so we need that gut to be working well. We need the liver to be working well. We need the balance in the little ecosystem in the gut to actually be really um, balanced so that the immune system, there's certain components of the immune system that are upregulated and downregulated. And you don't want this. Um, you sort of want to try and balance it out. And it's like, what's driving that? And so really working on the health of the gut is always one of the big foundations and where you need to go with any health condition, particularly when there's inflammation, and usually there's always inflammation, going what's happening in the gut, um, what are the symptoms. And sometimes we can have inflammation in the gut we don't even realise because our normal is our normal and we don't realise that it's actually not healthy. And we can be putting up with symptoms like bloating and gas or constipation or diarrhea, or sometimes there's not even direct gut symptoms, but you can still tell from how often you're going to the bathroom and how, you, how you're feeling in your body. And if there is inflammation, then that gut actually isn't working as well as it should be. Yes. And so it's sort of like being a detective and putting the pieces of the puzzle together. Um, the other when we go back to inflammation, it's like there's usually, I say, there's three big things that will drive inflammation. One is the gut, the health of the gut. This also includes our environmental toxins, how well we're detoxing, um, the, the state of our microbiome, so that balance of that little ecosystem in our gut. Um, blood sugar levels will really drive inflammation. So if we've got unregulated blood sugar levels and glucose spike happening all through the day, spikes and dips, that's also going to cause inflammation and our body has to deal with that rather than repairing and it, it, it goes into um, a trauma response, um, sort of emergency um, response when things like when we're constantly eating high sugar and then there might be other things that need attending to that don't get attended to potentially. It's like I'm totally like breaking it down for you. And so blood sugar is a big issue going, is there insulin resistance? Is this driving it? Because insulin resistance or blood sugar, irregulated blood sugar is also one of the big drivers of um, high antigens. And high antigens is also related to PCOS. And a lot of people may be, um, you know, weight gain, excess weight can cause antigens to be higher. It can also cause also estro um, estrogens to be higher. Um, so that they go hand in hand and so getting on top of that metabolic process like how we're digesting our food but also are our blood sugar levels stable and um, are our insulin levels stable or is this level of insulin resistance now when I talk about insulin resistance I'm talking about like Think about people at a party and someone's knocking at the door because insulin lets glucose into the cell. And if someone's knocking um, at the door and they can't hear it, the knocking's got to get louder. And that's essentially what happens. The glucose can't get into the cell, so more insulin is required. So when we have problems and we're insulin resistant, we will crave more sweet foods and carbohydrates because we need the energy because we're not actually getting it into the cell. So then what happens? It goes and gets stored as fat. Yeah. So that is a big problem. The other big part um, and um, the other big um, driver of inflammation is stress. And this is where I do a lot of work with people around going, what's the state of the nervous system? And how are you managing your stress? And often we've got this background alarm. And I can tell you, most people I come across with PMS, um, endometriosis, fibroids, any type of big inflammatory condition in the pelvis, 
there is trauma that is unresolved and it's stored in the body. And what I mean by that, I remember hearing this by a lecturer when I was um, studying um, nutrition. And there was a, a lady actually who was a practitioner and she came in and did a talk on endo because she, she did a lot of work with endo patients. And I remember her saying that, and I wasn't really, I hadn't really even gone down the emotional healing rabbit hole that much yet. It really stuck with me. She said there's a lot of emotion, excuse me, that we store in our pelvis, in our pelvic area, in our, and actually in our cervix, in our vagina, like trauma, if there's been sexual abuse, any type of abuse. Um, shutting down suppressing emotions a lot of that gets stored in our womb gets stored in our pelvic region and it will show up in the body as inflammation and so when we're talking about stress stress is the elephant in the room with this um with any condition and it's like okay where is my how is my body at the moment? And when I talk about trauma, it's you're holding on to things in that uh, in that sense where you actually don't feel safe in your own body. And it's this hypervigilant state where you may go, you just don't, you're on constant alert um, because that is what you grew up with or that is what you experienced or there's some sort of experience that you had. It may be with you know, be careful if you're judging yourself right now about it because there's trauma is coming on different scales. When I'm talking about it, it's basically like when I didn't feel seen, when I didn't feel heard, when my needs weren't, my, my emotional needs or my physical safety wasn't met. My emotional safety and my physical safety. And so we go into that reactive state a lot of the time as well. You know, a lot of us have had parents where or up um, caretakers where we felt like we were emotionally responsible. And I noticed this a lot as well with women with cycle issues where they take on a lot of burden. I feel emotionally responsible. This happens with, particularly with people as well that have a lot of anxiety for mum, for dad, for mum and dad getting divorced, for, you know, I'm responsible to take a look after the family. I'm you know, and there's a big um, load that is being carried around like a massive stack that a bad stack with a big, big, huge boulders in it. And we're carrying it around with us because we feel that we're emotionally responsible. And as a result, we don't make our own needs a priority. We don't know how to say no. We say yes to too many things and we don't rest and we burn out. And so when we're talking about stress, it's like where's that where's that ability to be able to ask your need to be met, to be able to say no, to rest, um, all of that aspect. And I, you know, this is me included. I was in that state for a very long time. It is I have to, it's something I have to very continually work on because I was in such a hyper vigilant um, protection mode for myself and in this alarm mode for so long, my whole life, until I learned these tools and actually, and, I, and then it's, you have these mechanisms where you want to go do, 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 because you need that, you go into alarm. And so it's a, it's a big piece of the puzzle with this, looking at how is that impacting our health and our hormones. So what happens? We get stressed, we produce cortisol, which is a hormone, as a result, we will then have a spike in blood glucose and insulin, which can actually then cause us to either crave more food, like sweet foods, sugary foods, or it will cause our androgen levels to um, rise. And it's when these levels of high cortisol are going on for a long, long time that this, is caused, this causes a ripple effect for the rest of our hormones. And we will not make adequate levels of progesterone if we have a high levels of cortisol and cortisol will then have a knock-on effect to um, making more androgen hormones, um, you know, causing us to even be high in estrogen, causing uh, us to hold belly fat, you know, when we can't shift weight around our belly, all of that sort of stuff. So it's really important to start to learn these tools. And what I notice is a lot of women don't even, they know they're stressed, 
but they don't really realize and they totally get to a point where there's this, this element of burnout i'm exhausted they don't really realize how bad it was and haven't it's because it's running in the background but i'm telling you <laughs> what i've observed and the work that i do with people is there is always a background alarm there's always this stress component going on with any inflammatory condition particularly endometriosis and stored trauma in the pelvic region and so we've got to start to learn how to first of all feel safe in our own bodies and how to release those things so that we can start to um, balance our hormones and feel safe because as long as you are in that hypervigilant state, there is always going to be inflammation going on and the body is never going to properly heal. So, 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 so important. It is a big, 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 big thing. And, you know, maybe a, a GP or a doctor, a specialist has said to you, you know, maybe maybe don't be so stressed and da, 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 da. But it's not the external environment that is, you know, often sometimes we do need to remove ourselves from certain things. Um, but it's also how we react to all those things around us and how we look after ourselves and that we create um, that element of self-love for ourselves so that we can care for ourselves when we know when to pull back and we can um, create healthy boundaries for ourselves and ask for help. That's also a boundary so that we don't burn out. That's it, right? Um, and so these are very much interconnected. And so we've got to look at the gut and we also need to look at our nervous system and what's happening with these hormones. Sometimes there's some really good functional testing that can be done. Um, if there is gut issues and there's a lot of bloating and stuff going on, sometimes it may be those issues need to be addressed first. Um, but there's some functional testing also with hormones that can be done, whether it's a saliva hormone test or um, dried urine, which is called the Dutch test, which is a very comprehensive, um, extensive test to be done um, that measures all the different types and it can be very good and helpful in seeing and figuring out exactly what's going on with you, even with your cortisol, with your melatonin, with your, um, your androgens, all of that, and that's really powerful. So using some functional testing that they don't use also in the mainstream um, system which, yes, it does cost money, but it is really then going, yes, are we doing this to get to the root cause? It's also looking at uh, what, um, if there's been gut issues going on for a long time and we haven't been eating a good diet or we're not absorbing correct nutrients and there's malabsorption issues, there's also often always be um, uh, a nutritional deficiencies going on as well. And uh, it can be also connected to the thyroid. What's happening with the thyroid is the thyroid coming along properly because um, that can impact our digestion, our ability to detoxify. Often if there's a lot going on, the thyroid will also be um, having issues and not coming along, particularly if there's nutritional deficiencies. So it's really got to be looked at from a not just a, oh, we're just going to look at this one thing with you and we'll send you over there to look at that other thing with someone else. It's not how it works. We've got to start looking at the body as a whole thing, not even though like not cutting our head off from our rest of our body and, and not um, cutting our body off from our head so that we can actually address the root cause. Yeah. So I really, um, if you've got any questions about any of that, because I just covered a lot, please. Um, comment below or send me um, a DM and if you would like to learn more about this or just have a chat if you're struggling with endometriosis please reach out to me because we can have a quick chat about what that can look like the way that I work um, and whether you are in a situation where yeah we could do something about this to get to the root cause if you even if you're going in a situation where you are about to go for surgery or if a consideration it's also like okay well how are you even going into the surgery like are you going in supported as best supported as you can and can you do a lot of work you could do a lot of work actually before you even went to surgery to make sure you'll have a better recovery and that then you once you've done the surgery reducing the and really getting to the root causes of things 
Um, it's not an easy path, but I can tell you also putting up the pain of endometriosis and this, um, you know, ultimately could end up in having to have a hysterectomy um, and other health conditions further down the line is, you know, really not a, it's not a fun path. And um, there's so much you can do to take your power back. And even though it's not a condition that would be core, would be I would be able to say it's reversible, it can be put into remission. And so you can take your power back with this if you choose, but you've got to also then take responsibility and not leave it up to the medical system to um, just take their word for it. You've got to actually take it on your own. And this is what happened to me when... I had my kidney out, um, it was 12 years ago now. I really was like not satisfied with the answers that I got given by from the surgeon and was like, okay, I've got to go and find now my own answers because I'm not just going to take that as given. You know, and when you're faced with your own health challenges and you start to value your life a lot, lot more and you actually, um, you know, reassess life. Um, so... Any questions, reach out. I hope that resonated. Um, and um, yeah, I'll chat to you soon. See you guys. Bye.